Hey, triathlon fans. Today, we had the pleasure of catching up with Xterra World Champion, Josiah Midah. In this episode, we discuss Xterra Oak Mountain happening on May 8th, what it means to be a pro, shifting perspectives and attitudes in the sport, triathlon's evolution of different formats, and Josiah's focus and goals for the year. We hope you enjoy. Josiah, yes. what's going on, man? <laughs> Not much. Excited to uh, do an Xterra. Seriously. <laughs> I mean, how long has it been? I guess since Maui 2019. So. Wow. Yeah. A little That's while. Cool. Year and a half almost. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of mind blowing that it's been so long. Yeah. And I, I feel like I've raced more than most people. Uh, but I really, I have not done a triathlon in a year and a half. So that's kind of, kind yeah. of weird. You did, most recently, you did a mountain bike race, right? What have I done recently? Um, uh, yeah, just, just a little it. local, yeah, local uh, short track race. So that was fun. Yeah, luckily the, the Vail Rec District, they've had, you know, even through the summer, they had their local town series. It, and, and it, what happened is every like fast junior and even pro rider in the Rocky mountains, like came to the town series because nothing else was going on. And yeah. so we, we had, you know, the, a pro wave with like 40 people wow. in it with, you know, like 15, 20 kids that were under 18 that were just ripping fast. <laughs> and so it was, I don't know, it was kind of wild. So I got to race a lot, but just, you know, really small local races. Yeah. Well, that's fun though, at the same time that you don't yeah. have to travel too far and you get such a competitive field just in your backyard. Um, but uh, how, how kind of how long in advance did you know that uh, Xterra was having this race, that Oak Mountain was, was actually a, a go? Uh, I mean, I was hopeful that it would, it would be on the calendar, you know, from forever. I, I mean, I, I was, I was hoping it would be the first race and if there's a place that could, I, you know, the truth is we, we know that, you know, certain places, you know, if the race is in California in March, no, let's check that one off the list, you know, but, you know, Alabama in May, there's a pretty good chance that it's going to happen. I think more of the resistance was, you know, from Xterra themselves, you know, whether or not it's something that they can put on with the crew coming from Hawaii and, but the timing was right. And, and I think that Alabama is the right place to host it. Yeah, you talk about that. It's funny. Um, so I had on my race schedule myself was Ironman Texas. And I was yeah. like, this is like, there's no question about it. At that point in time, the governor had just lifted like all bans on, you know, mask mandates and stuff like that. Then literally in the town that, uh, you know, I was racing in, they had a marathon. And after the marathon, like a week or two later, they pulled the plug on Ironman Texas. And I was like, oh my God, like, how does that even happen? Like you talk about certain locations that are just like, you, you know how they've approached the pandemic and you, they've approached it with a little bit more casual flavor, I guess, you know, like Florida being one of those locations where they're like, yeah, you know, we want, we want to live life normally. We want to keep our businesses running and operating properly. And I've always looked at Texas as being one of those places. I'm sure you look at Alabama being one of those places. I do too. Um, and I was just like, you know, go, I was basically like cruising into taper mode for an Ironman. And I was just like, wow, I can't believe this didn't happen. You know, so you, you talk about places that you're like, yeah, it, it looks, but like so crazy how the rug could still be like pulled out from under you, you know, yeah. at, at any time, you know? Yeah. But I think you're close enough now where you don't have to worry. Yeah, hopefully. And, and there's been some precedents that have gone off well in the last couple of weeks. So I think it's, I think it's a go. So how, uh, you know, how has training looked for you? Um, you obviously, you know, you, this was something you said was something like on your radar. You're like, you know, it, it makes sense. It looks like it's going to happen. Uh, how has training been going for you? Um, Pretty good. I mean, I, I trained pretty consistently through the pandemic, um, but a little bit less for performance, I would say, you know, with, I, I, I kept 
you know, some structure in my program, but I wasn't, you know, doubling down on back-to-back -back threshold workouts. You know, I was, I was hitting, you know, Strava a little bit more, having some fun with that. Um, and then this year, you know, trying to, to have a, a build up to racing, but it's still, it's, it's just so early in Colorado. Yeah, I've, I've been on the mountain bike just a handful of times, um, you know, on the only little loop that's open. I, normally I'd be going down to Ruta, Moab, and I, I haven't done that. So it's still very early for me, you know, May coming from the mountains. We just, it snowed last night, <laughs> you know, so it, it's one of those situations, but yeah, excited to race uh, and see what happens. How is, how is swimming done, been done? Cause I, I'm, I mean, the pools, obviously you're not going to get in open water up there <laughs> this no. time of year. Um, but like the, the access to swimming has been weird. It has, I, I've been pretty fortunate compared to other places where uh, we've had our master's group that, you know, had started out really strict, you know, and reserving lane and keeping workouts under an hour. So, you know, not able to do the, the volume of, of training that I'd like to do, which, which I kind of need to do since swimming is my weakness. I have to really double down on swimming. And, uh, but since probably January 1st, I've been able to get, you know, the occasional five, 6,000 yard workout and then trying to, you know, jump in four days a week, five days a week, occasionally six days a week. So I've been pretty lucky with that, but you know, I, I told some, you know, I've had a couple like really big swims I'm like, whoa, you must be swimming well. I said, no, don't, <laughs> no, don't be mistaken. I'm, I'm trying to get back to my average swimming that I was at before, <laughs> you know, I'm not going to set the world on fire with my swim. That's for sure. Do you, do you know, um, is it going to be like a normal race? Are they going to do stuff like, and by what I mean is virus wise, like, is it a mass start race yeah. the same as normal or is it like time trial start or something weird? Yeah. So the, the pro race, they'll do pro men, pro women, separate waves. Um, all the, the, the pro athletes will either show a vaccine card or um, get tested on site with rapid test um, or not race. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then all the age group waves are going to be time trial start. So only the pro the elites will um, go off on mass mass start and then course changes uh, just so that there's there's no lapping on the course like normally we do two laps around the lake in Alabama it'll be a one lap 10k so yeah there'll be, there'll be a fair amount of modifications did they do any modifications to the bike or is it just on the run um the course has changed but it's all the known trails. Luckily the bike was one big loop. So it's going to be one big 20 mile loop on the bike, which will, which will be nice. And that's what Oak mountain is known for is their, the really good single track out there. Yeah. Is it, so is it essentially the same course it's always been? Essentially. I mean, there's, they keep cha changing it. Like, well, I don't know if you remember all the names of the trails, Jimmy, but we like, well, you know, I, I remember <laughs> blood rock, but I mean, that's yeah. about it. <laughs> yeah, we'll still do, do Blood Rock. They got a new single track, Jekyll and Hyde, that we've been doing the last couple times there. And then normally we finish with this Rattlesnake Ridge. Well, we're going to run that instead. So then they move wow. us over to Johnson's Mountain, which you've probably done. They, we used to do that like 10 years ago. So, yeah, it's, it's essentially basically all those trails in, in Oakmont. I mean, maybe there's 25 to 30 miles of trails. So yeah. <laughs> with, with 20 miles, we pretty much do you know, well, they've been building a little bit out there too. Yeah, they're always adding. They're something. building. Mountain biking is is going through this change of like what is mountain biking, right? And so you're you don't gen, you I don't know what they've been building. I haven't looked at it that closely, but you see a lot of stuff is like skills trails and like enduro type things and all that, and and not a lot of like cross country trails. But then parks build trails that are multi-use right that are hiking focused but then you can ride them and i guess that's now a cross-country trail but <laughs> yeah i mean the the trend is is more of this flow track that you see going around in colorado yeah. mm -hmm. and, and it's a lot of fun it's not the old school mountain bike you know with just roots and rocks and you know yeah. trying to figure out how to do stuff it's a lot of like berm corners and 
um, different rollers and features. It's extended BMX. <laughs> like, yeah. I grew up racing BMX and it just reminds me, it's, I don't know, I'm going to sound like some jaded old guy, but it's, it's so contrived in my mind. Like, I mean, it, it's not, it's not, I mean, you, there's, you go out and you like totally sanitize a trail, take out all the rocks and any kind of technical challenge that might make you fall over or slow down. And then you build up other challenges, which are, you know, your jumps and like berms and stuff. And then your, your climb to get there is a dirt road that everyone whines about, you know? And I won't even start talking about what's gonna happen with e-bikes, but I mean, it's one of those things that it's like, well, it's good that mountain biking seems to be having a little bit of a, of a resurgence in popularity. But then as like a guy that started racing, riding mountain bikes in the eighties, it's like, well, this isn't really mountain biking. I mean, this is, this is like BMX through the woods. <laughs> well, it's, I don't know. I, I think that, well, in Oak Mountain, they've, they've done a pretty good job of preserving like all the existing trails. It's almost like they're rerouting, you know, here's the A line, here's the B line, you know, type of thing. Yeah. But um, I don't know. I think that in general, you know, more, more trails are better. Um, yeah. You know, it gets a lot more, more people out on the trails um, as long as, you know, they're still accessible and we're, we're still adding trails that everybody can enjoy, but, uh, but it is skill wise, it's different. I just had an athlete that I coach and, you know, talking about, oh, uh, you know, they just raced in soldier hollow, you know, technically it was very challenging. I said, you know, what, what about it? You know, was it, the old school stuff was it roots and rocks that you're having trouble with or is it being comfortable in the air you know with, yeah. with rollers and drops and things like that and so it does introduce like a different skill set and you'll you see that on the world cup you know you think of like that world cup or the olympics in rio that yeah. was completely like artificial man-made thing but it wasn't easy right it's yeah. like this to totally different type of skill set that you need yeah yeah, that uh, there's a guy here that does skill skills coaching, um, whose name, yeah, you know, of course, <laughs> totally escapes me right now. Um, but he was, I think, he might have been on the Olympic team for BMX, and like Jill Kintner works here or works here, well, kind of, but lives here, and she's a enduro, but she was a BMX Olympian as well. And so the um, God, what is that guy's name? It's right on the tip of my tongue. But, um, ah, driving me nuts. Uh, but some of like the, the pro mountain biker, like uh, US national team came here for like some skill skills training, but it was mostly learn to jump training. <laughs> so, um, cause we have a whole lot of those flow trails and, and jump type trails. Um, but that, you know, cause the world cup now you've got, it's usually more of like drops but there's a little bit there. Sometimes there's like jumps, right? But yeah. you do see that. Um, and it's funny if you watch the World Cup, because then like the uh, the the race in Czech Republic that now I'm forgetting where that is too. Got too many thoughts going through my head. But there's a super rooty like, like power climb there that usually people might have to dismount and everything. And they just, when you're watching it on TV, they're talking about like how this is like, such this this hard unusual like maybe you should take this section out <laughs> and it's like <laughs> roots on a climb man you're on a full suspension bike that weighs 20 pounds shut up like, who who put the roots there <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly but it's like hey, we should really fill this in put some put some rock armory but anyway i'm not i'm now i'm starting to sound too negative but it's what i'm getting at in my head that i'm coming across is like complaining about everything is things like like blood rock and stuff like that with a new generation like and and when I say new generation it's even really like even the last five years but just the the trend in the industry and like how you build a mountain bike angles and and suspension and you know travel I mean it used to be like 80 mil right if you're on a cross country bike and now like 120 on a cross country bike is not unusual and you can get on a trail bike that's got somewhere between 130 and 150 and it's still going to be like maybe a 25 pound bike 
And so if you're like the average racer, I mean, now you go to blood rock, if you're on something like that, you just like roll down that no problem, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the geometry that, you know, that even cross country bikes have gravitated towards is more um, enduro geometry as far as the, the rake on the front fork and stuff. So yeah, yeah doing some, a feature like blood rock or something, you, you kind of point and shoot and you should be okay. Right? Yeah. <laughs> well, I saw some discussion on one of the, one of the things on Facebook and someone was talking about blood rock and they were nervous and scared about it and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, Dan Hugo broke his collarbone there one year, which actually that happened right in front of me, <laughs> like immediately in front of me, he went down and I like, I didn't realize it was so bad, but, um, but the year that, that year that happened, like we didn't have dropper posts. I think he might've been on a hardtail because that was still like, people were like, do I ride full suspension? Or do I ride a hardtail? You know, it was a completely different world. And like this person on Facebook's like, I'm nervous because I heard that people get hurt there. And like they they were just getting kind of railed by people. It's like, oh, it's not even a big deal. I mean, it's just a little bumpy, you know? So it's interesting how that's evolved. But my, what I'm getting at is, I mean, do you think that this, you know, and at, will Alabama's course stay the way it is? Or will, do you think Xterra is going to get requests that it become more, you know, where's the flow section or where's something? I mean, is that what triathlon and cross country racing is? Because if you look at what we were just talking about with Olympic level, World Cup level cross country and the, like what they're putting into those races, I mean, is Xterra going to go there? Is, is a trail system like Alabama going to put something like that in? Or is it going to be a little bit more like what we're talking about, kind of your old school cross country? Yeah, I, well, I think that probably all options are on the table, but the reality is that, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an event that needs to cater to the masses. So I know, you know, like in Europe, we're introducing some short track stuff that's for elites only. Um, and, you know, maybe there could be, you know, something like that, but um, most, for a majority of the trails, they are not, uh, you know, they're rideable by, everybody 99% of the route is going to be rideable yeah uh, every person you know not at the same speeds um, but there's very few but then you, you go to you know a certain place like um, Quebec or Victoria and it's just a little bit higher level or even you know some of the smaller races like on the east coast I'm sure um, they're very people would consider those very technical. And that's a di totally different discussion is like, what's, what's technical and what's not. Um, some people think that Colorado courses are not technical, um, but then you have somebody who's not used to descending at, you know, 30 miles an hour and going through bumps and rocks and turns yeah. and that all of a sudden they're like, whoa, that was way more technical than I thought. What was the deal with that? <laughs> so I don't know. I, I just think that off that's what's exciting about off-road is that there's a variety of courses and it used to be early in my career. It was okay. I'm good at this climbing course and this course does not suit me well. And now it's like, okay, let's, what skills do I need to do well on any type of course? And I think that's, that's, that's where I, you know, always wanted to go and hopefully other people feel the same way. Yeah. Well, and that kind of takes us to, you know, the, the, the big news, I guess, around Alabama other than there's going to be a triathlon <laughs> after a, a while off is that there's, you know, we got some of the roadies coming over, right? And you yeah. got like Starkowitz and I forget who the other. Eric is coming. Yeah. Lagerstrom. Yeah. And so, you know, again, back in the day when, when we kind of saw that 10 years plus ago, you know, you'd get those guys come over and they might be like super fit, like they've got the engine, but they don't have the skills. Um, what do you think? What do you think that you, I mean, are they, obviously they're, they're, they're very fit and very fast. Everyone always seems to like under, undersell Xterra athletes as, as like, you know, just a bunch of dirtbag mountain bikers that, you know, don't swim fast and ride mountain bikes. <laughs> but right. when you actually get on the course, that's not the case. So, I mean, you think that's going to be, 
they're gonna you're gonna have these these big name roadie guys show up and they're gonna be you know eighth or ninth like it used to be or do you think they'll be in the kind of in it uh i, I we have a very strong um field you know to, speaking just specifically about the men's field it's a it's a very strong men's field it's not crazy deep i mean there's five six really fast guys so yes could um one of those guys get on the podium yes possibly uh, but i think it's going to be um, pretty shocking not just um you know technically navigating the course but the totally different type of um, pacing energy system and you know how they're used to rationing out that power like okay i'm going to sit you know right here at 88 percent of my threshold power yeah. you know no you're going to be 100 and you know, 80% of threshold power than 150%. And then you're going to yeah. come into a turn and then you're going to stomp, stomp, stomp again. And then, okay, now here's a long climb. And now I'm going to be at, you know, hundred percent of threshold power for nine minutes, you know, here. And, and it's just, it's going to be a totally different type of racing. It's very yeah. dynamic. You know, it's more, you know, time-wise, it's more like Olympic distance, uh, but you have to have this incredible kind of bike strength to be able to run well. And that's, you know, you look at like ITU guys that come and do it. And all of a sudden, you know, a 31 minute ITU racer is, is running like average, you know, or above average, like what, you know, what happened? Yeah. They ran a 38 minute 10 K, but they're a 31 minute 10 K guy. And like, yeah, well, that bike is really hard. <laughs> you know, yeah. it well, really it's a completely takes a different, like you said, I mean, the power, the, what you're asking yourself physically is one thing, but then there's, there's the other, aspects that I think get under underlooked <laughs> overlooked uh, like the the position that you're on you know most road triathlons you're doing almost nothing with your upper body you know you're so now you're talking about a full body cycling event but also your position on the bike is completely different um and one thing that I, I remember everyone not everyone but people complaining about or, or questioning a lot in the clinics that we hosted at before Alabama was how do I drink? You know, this trail is so windy. And then when it's not windy, it's bumpy. And do I carry a water bottle or do I have a camelback? And like, how do I even get the thing in my mouth if I'm constantly like trying to go around a corner and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And so then that changes your, what you're doing with your nutrition, you know, cause you're just, even just stay focused on the course, you know, you end up ignoring the nutrition and like you said it's olympic distance but you also can't ignore it the nutrition aspect the hydration aspect because alabama is usually hot and humid <laughs> so so there's a lot of those other aspects that i, I think yeah it's, yeah i think you, you never know for sure a little bit i don't i mean he's obviously super strong i don't know the other guys at all but i mean andrew's also in chicago which is just known for its mountain biking, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, so that's what you, what you don't know. And, and you actually hope that, you know, some of the, that they do actually have, you know, a certain level of skill that, you know, can get them through the course. Like, yeah, we have a, a couple guys in that men's field that could, uh, you know, that ve have very high level mountain bike skill and some that, that don't, but they know how to race an Xterra course like that. And, yeah, they're going to, you know, lose time and bobble in corners. And the thing about Xterra is that there, you know, there's a hundred things that you're going to do that you could have done better. And, mm -hmm. and maybe that they have a, a level of, you know, who you just don't know, like uh, Eric Langerstrom said he raced BMX when he was a kid. So maybe he does have a lot of, maybe he can go around a corner as good as anybody else in the race. Um, but it's been a long time since he did something like that. And so, um, and same with, with Andy Starkwitz, like maybe he, he does have some skills that he's built some doing some cross training on the bike. And I, I guess he can handle, you know, technical, you know, bike road bike courses pretty well too. So yeah, that, I mean, you hope that they do have enough level of skill, um, to get through the race and, and have it, you know, be something that they walk away from saying, wow, that was really cool. Um, I could do, you know, these 10 things a lot better and get a lot better at this. Yeah, um, but I think they're going to be shocked at just how dynamic the race is. And it's not like, oh, I got to, 
you know, drink every 15 minutes and, you know, stay at this intensity, it's going to, there's going to be, you know, 50 things thrown at them and they're going to hope that they do most of them well. <laughs> yeah. You know, and there's going to be, yeah. everybody walks away with, you know, road trap on, ah, oh, you know, I, I, I missed that, that bottle handoff and it screwed up my race. Well, now it's going to be, here's 10 things that screwed up my race, you know, Yeah. <laughs> all these excuses I have. Yeah. Well, and that's the, I mean, the good thing, I think this has always been the good thing of having, I mean, even way back when, you know, you had the, the, the actual back-to-back -back double in Hawaii. And so then you'd get, you know, Maka and Peter Reed, Tim DeBoom and Whiteoff and all that, all those guys. Like, I mean, you'd have the, the field at Maui was deeper than the field at Kona in some ways, you know, cause you had the coming together of everyone. Um, but that gave, I mean, that gives Xterra a whole lot of attention, right? And that's why I'm, I'm intrigued for this week or this week, this race in is because you, you know, maybe this will get us in the news again, right? It, like Xterra kind of fell off the radar because triathlon has shifted to everything is, is 70.3 and, and Ironman every once in a while, I'll toss a challenge in there or whatever. But I mean, and if it's not that, we're talking about the Olympic stuff in Xterra. And some of that is there's been upheaval in Xterra's ownership and there's this and this and this different events and all that. But I, I'm hoping that this is kind of brings a little attention back to the off-road aspect. Because um, then also, I think what you are what you just mentioned with the different challenges, I wonder if coming out of the COVID world <laughs> you know as we return to normal maybe not just this year but even into the next couple of years it it seems like that there's a split in people who do sport not just triathlon but participant sport in general being one side is like i am dying to do races again like i miss it i haven't been able to do anything there's no point and like what's my training if i don't have something to train for and on the other side you have the people who are like you know I don't even really need to do races. I just want the experience. I want to do all the, I want to go and do these like epic challenges of, you know, the ride, the Colorado trail or do the, this, 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 you know, things that are, and, and I don't really care if I have a number. Right. And so I wonder if, if the Xterra off-road triathlon idea can be like a merging of those two things, because it's a new challenge for the racers and it's a, experiential not necessarily only about the race but there's a lot of people going to do this thing aspect to fit that other side um i mean i would hope that that would be what it is because i want to see xterra survive because in hindsight of my career i think i was more of an xterra racer than anything else um but they've always been the black sheep or the you know whatever kind of this sideshow of triathlon right but in a way it's kind of the most pure aspect because it's it's not so antiseptic you know 27 different data made it measuring devices on you and you know an alarm telling you when to drink your damn water bottle you know and you don't have a water bottle anyway you've got this like thing that squirts at you you know whatever but it, it it's not like just watching some of the results from, or some of the people talking about um, St. George last week. And like you were saying, it's like, I dropped my water bottle, therefore I was done. It's like, <laughs> dude, it's a water bottle, man. There's another one coming up. Like, that's not the end of your race. But literally people yeah. are on there like, yeah, you know, my shoulder was a little crampy in the swim, so I dropped out. That was, you're five minutes into it. <laughs> like, yeah. I, I do think that there's, there's kind of, I don't know if it was, I think it was happening before the pandemic, but I think that there's an emergence of um, people that are, are, look, are really looking for those genuine challenges uh, and, and, and looking for adventure uh, that they might not get um, just from doing road triathlons that are, you know, you might do a course in a very different place, but the course is gonna be pretty much the same, you know, uh, where Xterra, or off-road triathlon, it's truly an adventure. And every course 
you can't compare one one performance to the next. You can't say, oh, I ran, you know, the 10K in Beaver Creek at this time and the 10K in Alabama this time. They're totally different. Um, and so people that are looking for just just new different challenges and looking for adventure and looking for something that they say, wow, like that was really cool and really fun, you know, not just what was your, you know, what were your splits? What was your yeah. average heart rate? What, you know, like. <laughs> There's this really good uh, meme going around and maybe we'll share it. We can share it with this video or whatever, but it's this, uh, it's these two, I guess they're runners, but it really doesn't matter. These two guys talking to each other and the, the one dude's like looking at his watch. Right. And, and he's like, I just did your, or the, the other dude goes, how was your ride or your run? And he goes, I did, you know, it was, it was two hours and five minutes and I averaged 300 Watts and I covered, you know, uh, 4,000 feet of climbing and blah, 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 blah. And the other guy goes, was it fun? And he goes, doesn't say. <laughs> and cool. I'm like, dude, that sums up where we are like so perfectly because it's, yeah. it's, you know, you, again, people doing races and they finish like, instead of how did it go? It's like, oh, my wattage, I, my, my power on the bike was five watts lower than I wanted it to be, you know, which, I mean, there's, there's, there's value in all those metrics and all those tools and stuff like that. But then that's why I was, I think that some of that is what you just said too about pre COVID, but COVID forced us to like sit inside and think about all this stuff for a year. Yeah. Right. And, and you come out with like people that are like, you know what, I want the adventure and other people that are like, no, I'm all about the, like, give me the numbers and the, all that kind of thing. But on that note, with what you just said about, craving maybe new experiences, new challenges and stuff, then, I mean, obviously the, the hot, the two, the two hottest things right now in sport or in endurance sport, although I don't know if you can call enduro endurance sport, but let's call it is enduro and gravel racing, right? Like those are the new trick, like cool things. So, I mean, there's some trail racing, but I, honestly, that stuff's been around for a long time, like ultras and sub ultras and blah, blah, blah. And Xterra has already got a trail run. So I, in my mind, that's taken care of. Like we're already tapping into the new thing there. So how long before Xterra has a gravel triathlon, which is something I was trying to put together in 2019. I've given up on because now I'm not doing dirt try anymore and all that, but I'm curious if it'll happen. Um, but gravel triathlon and or swim run. Like, do you think they're going to go that route or are they going to just keep doing off-road travel? Well, if Xterra is the brand, I don't know if Xterra the brand would, would be the mover in that direction, but I do think like, why not? You know, and gravel at first gravel, like, okay, well, this is really cool right now. The bike industry, you know, has jumped on board and they're, you know, making gravel bikes. And now it, it has been around long enough that, Hey, it does seem to have a lot of staying power and people want to get off busy streets. Yeah. Um, but you know, these gravel rides are hundred miles, hundred, you know, 200 K 200 miles. Um, but why not, but why not have, you know, a gravel based race? What I would hate to see is a gravel triathlon with adapted tri bikes with the gravel wheels, which that would totally be we're almost that. there. Yeah. That would totally you look at the stuff that, um, that's happening in the, in the gravel scene and it's, it's, you know, arrow, arrow, gravel, blah, blah, blah. I mean, it, dirty can, can, well, we're not calling it dirty cans anymore, but whatever, whatever dirty cans is being called now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, the last, the last time we really had it, it was guys on, on arrow bars, you know, little spinachi bars, if anyone remembers what those are, but, you know, arrow yeah. bars of some sort, and, <laughs> you know, the, the arrow helmets. And I mean, because you're, and it makes sense. I hate this. I'm smart enough to understand physics and aerodynamics and all that kind of stuff. And I despise it. Like your aerodynamics ruins everything I like. Well, and that's, yeah. And that's, what's nice about like mountain biking is generally it's about you, right? Yeah. It's about your output and it's not about sucking wheels and stuff like that where, and that's what I like about gravel 
you know, right now it seems to be like the strongest rider does usually, usually win. Right. And you pretty much have to do, you know, 80, 90% of that work by yourself. Um, but that would be my fear is that, okay, let's, uh, let's make this into, uh, you know, a, you know, these adapted bikes, you know, that were, you know, taking a, whatever it might be specialized shiv or whatever with wider, you know, fork and rear, yeah. you know, triangle and, and adapting gravel tires <laughs> to that, or, you know, it's some, I don't know, you know, yeah, that, that, that's what I love the, the purity of mountain biking and, and triathlon too, is the non-drafting triathlon is like, you're out there doing the work by yourself. Um, it's mm -hmm. not about just about who has the best equipment or who conserves energy the most. Yeah. Well, so on that note, and because of, of what we talked about with how this format is going to go and the post COVID world and all that kind of thing, you get all the, you know, every, every year at Kona, someone day after posts the picture of the big age group, you know, on like halfway down the queen K with a Peloton of 80 dudes or whatever. Right. And well, everybody's drafting. It's like, on that course, in that situation, you almost can't draft. Like right. you get sucked into it. And literally, once you're sucked into it, now you're pulled along. And so you're part of the Peloton. So what I'm getting at is because of some of the restrictions that we're having and how races happen, you're getting a lot more like time trial start thing. And then that that changes the entire dynamic because you can you can do all kinds of things, right? Like you can you can send age groups off so that everyone's going in a wave, uh, an interval wave, or you can just mix and mash everyone in the entire race in all different places. So you never know exactly where the other person that time-wise you're actually racing. So then, then you, you don't have a vested interest in sitting in on someone and because maybe you're not going fast enough compared to the guy that you're actually racing that you don't even know who that is, right? So does that... Do you think this idea of interval starts might be something that because of the virus and because of the situation and limitations in terms of what we're allowed to do now might get a little bit of a kickstart in like, hey, this is actually how we should do triathlon because it takes all of that, you know, cheating, drafting, blah, blah, blah out of it. The, the other complaint is, well, now I don't know, I'm not racing head to head with someone, but you kind of didn't know that anyway, especially in the, yeah. in the age groups. Right. So. Do you yeah, think I think, well, there's, there's pluses and minuses to, to every format, but you know, there, there's some races doing that before. And, and I know that some people would specifically seek out those races because of that. Maybe it was somebody who was, you know, not the strongest swimmer um, and they wanted, you know, to get a little bit more clear water by themselves or just didn't want to be swam over. Um, and, but they're super strong on the bike. And so that time trial format was really well from the, for them. And they didn't perceive that, you know, that top group of swimmers has this huge advantage that they're doing the legal drafting all together while you're working your butt off, you know, and, and making marginal gains on that lead pack. Uh, so, yeah, I think it, it maybe it is a little bit more fair in some situations um but yeah i don't know i think it's it's interesting i i think that we're all fortunate to, to have you know any kind of format right now yeah so i think right. people are, are pretty open to trying just about anything right now and we'll see kind of what sticks yeah well and that was my only other thought on this kind of like what's going to happen with races in the future road that i'm kind of going down is you know the the rise of the concept of an enduro do you see that ever coming into triathlon or specifically like off-road xterra triathlon where you're maybe you're you're doing some kind of timed section which then that opens it up and maybe it doesn't need to be swim bike run maybe it's swim run bike run swim bike bike run you know <laughs> changes up the entire yeah that that like in Colorado where we don't have a lot of water and like the rate we had that race in Crested Butte until they quit allowing us to use the private lake but there's other lakes they're just not very easy to get to you know so could you like have a race let's say in Crested Butte where you start with the bike and you do you ride 
and then maybe you run over to Long Lake and then you do the swim there because now you're way up at the lake and then you like ride back, you know, but you're seeing, I, what's that? There's a gravel race. Is it wild horse gravel? That is essentially a gravel enduro. And so, and there, there was the race that I was somewhat involved with in, um, in Golden called the Golden Giddyup or the, is it Golden Giddyup? Something Giddyup. But, um, and that was an enduroized cross country course. So you timed the climb up lookout and then you rode a little transfer and then you timed the descent down another trail and then you rode over to like one of the mesas and you timed a climb over here and then you timed a descent. But do you think, I mean, does that, yeah, let's say we did that. Is that still a triathlon <laughs> or did I just invent something? You just I I want to pat Jimmy, you pat might be able to get maybe there's five or six participants so you could get to sign up. <laughs> yeah. Well, so we have you know we have the the GoPro Mountain Games uh, coming up and yeah. they've tried lots of different formats like you know there's this ultimate mountain challenge that I've always done that you know used to be kayak cross country mountain bike trail race road bike time trial and at first it was let's combine all the times and like, no let's make it a point system. You know, like then it's how could we get more participants like and you can't get more participants by making it more exclusive like let's add an enduro and let's add um this peppy's face off and let's add let's make it you know 10 events who can who do the best at 10 events yeah. maybe they'll get more people like i don't think you get more people by doing <laughs> by you know requiring three different bikes to do one yeah. one weekend race and a kayak and a so I, that's I think, kind of what killed adventure racing is it's expensive <laughs> to yeah. just have all those toys, right? <laughs> right. So I don't know. I mean, there's there's little niche, you know, events that might be appealing to people, but I think you know, making something that requires an incredible amount of skill or an you know, a really expensive equipment is just going to be more and more exclusive. So it's more. Yeah. Like, I don't know. Not not a huge fan of adding and adding and adding to yeah. make things harder and harder for people to be able to achieve a certain amount of uh, competency to actually do the event. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, I, I agree with you. I mean, but you know, one I, thing, like, why not, uh, why not have, you know, like a Strava challenge, like you're talking about, like in the middle of a race, like, Hey, let's, let's see who, you know, rode that, you know, blood rock plus Jekyll and Hyde the fastest. You yeah. know, and, and that could be like that, right? And that could just be like a fun thing. You know, if people have the devices and that's yeah. a really easy thing to do. And that's what they're doing a lot at, you know, at Grand Fondo or you know, any enduro event or something. Yeah, why not have little time sections yeah. there just for fun and and use some of this technology that we have out there. Yeah. But yeah, what was that, Gerard? No, I said Boulder Peak, I think, did something similar to that. When you up that big climb. Yeah, didn't they have a frame yeah. for Yeah, they had a frame for that stage. old stage yeah. road. I think yeah. that's a lot of fun. Yeah. Escape from Alcatraz, I think, did that with the sand ladder. Yeah. I mean, with these things that you have those, those kind of known sections, that's an interesting thing. On the other side of that, though, is like, some of the Ironman races and also Boulder Peak where you have speed limits on the descent, which is <laughs> because, you know, someone crashed into a bear once, but um, that literally happened. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, that's, I guess what I was getting at is I think all of the, well, not think, all of the, the big, race organizers, whether it's Challenge or Xterra or Ironman, you know, they've all said that they're even, even the, whatever we're calling the ITU now, what is it? World Triathlon? You know, like the, the World Cup Series, they're, they've all mentioned at least, if not been really adamant that they're, they're running into a retention problem um, with trying to, you know, Ironman is, is seeing a lot of like one and done. It's a bucket list thing. Yeah. I'm going to spend a ton of money on this like one or two year process. I'm going to do my Ironman and then get my tattoo or whatever. And I'm out. Um, and some of that is when you're talking about really long events like that, it's hard to 
if you're your average person that has a family, a job, kids, blah, blah, blah. I mean, it's a hard thing to say, all right, I'm going to dedicate this much time and blah, 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 you know, long term. So it's, which what I'm getting at, though, is the, this like maybe evolution of format idea. I mean, like, that's why I was bringing up the enduroized kind of triathlon or, you know, with the World Cup stuff you've seen. I mean, the fact that we're doing like sprint World Cups now is, is kind of crazy. And they're talking about just like maybe triathlon in the Olympics is now a sprint distance thing and a team oriented. Well, you know, that's all, you know, what's, what what's people gonna, watch. what's going to sell yeah. for people to watch. Yeah. How are we yeah. going to make this more exciting for people? And that's yeah. like the short, that's like the short track Xterra. Which, yeah. What can we stream for 45 minutes? That's going to get people really excited about it. Yeah. Um, well, and that's, I guess that's where I was going. And maybe this is a completely different discussion for a different time, but you know, what, there's, there's a lot of what ifs, like what is watch, you know, because everyone, no one, it's not on TV anymore. Everything's streamed. So then you're driven by, by actual eyeballs, actual numbers, you know, and like longer course, even I'll, I'll even say iron or Xterra distance, you know, if you're showing something on TV, that's going to take two and a half, three hours to show, you know, the current attention span is nowhere near that, but if you mix up the format and you do it in snippets now, well, is that more, more interesting? And then, and ultimately what I'm getting at, I guess, is that your, your race organizers are trying to create a product that are going to get eyeball. They're going to be able to, I mean, they're not, they're for-profit organizations, right? So they have to get participants, but they also have to get some other kind of revenue stream or, or two. So that's where I was going with, do you think there's an evolution, a potential evolution or changing offering of like, what is, let's just stick to Xterra, you know, is, is there going to be some gravel racing? Is there going to be some enduro style, you know, is there going to be, does that open up different venues because you don't have to have the lake right next to the swim? Like if we did it at Sea Otter, we could swim at the ocean and then have some kind of transfer stage and then get over to where Sea Otter is. And that brings off-road triathlon into the huge event that is Sea Otter, that there's never really been a place for off-road triathlon or triathlon in general, because the, there is no water at the racetrack at Laguna Seca. There's a tiny duck pond, but you don't want to swim in that, right? But that's eventually, I guess my question rather than just a giant rant is do you think gravel enduro swim run all that kind of stuff like are these avenues that xterra should explore to grow xterra like what is the idea of xterra you know as a brand or how, how do they get more people yeah i don't know i mean i think that you don't want to dilute it too much um and you want to stick with what you're good at but i i, I would think the evolution is more towards, uh, you know, using some of the elites to have, you know, something like that short track race or what's happening with some of the other races is, is a looped format, right? Let's do, you know, two loop swim, a two loop bike, or maybe it's a three loop bike um, and a two loop run, or even, even more, you know, yeah. where it is a little bit more of that kind of short track style, but it's, it's lap courses, it's, it's exciting to watch. And then maybe there's a different course for the, the age group that's that's more traditional. But I think a lot of that was kind of put on pause a little bit by the pandemics and how like Oak Mountain were going there and they're trying to figure out how not to have the loops, you know, on yeah. a course for the social distancing. So so I don't know, but I think using using the elites to, you know, if they want to cover a race that people are going to watch, that's where they can manipulate the, the pro race a little bit um but keep kind of that standard course for the, the age group wave but i don't personally i don't like that because i like to do those epic courses i want to feel like i accomplished something i want to do one big 20 mile loop with four thousand feet of climbing like you know what i mean and yeah so it, it kind of changes for me that's 
that's not as exciting for me to watch, or are we going to take a race that was two and a half hours and condense it down to, you know, something under an hour? Again, not too excited about that myself personally, but why not use, you know, some of the elites and, and experiment with some of that stuff and see, you know, what might drive some more eyeballs or get more people interested in the sport. So yeah. I'm curious to know, uh, you talk about like leveraging elites and, you know, to grow the sport. Has there been, or have you been involved or has Xterra, or do you know of Xterra being involved in any conversations with the PTO, the Pro Triathlon Organization? I mean, it seems heavily focused and skewed towards the, um, the road side of things. Um, you know, and I didn't know if there, quite frankly, if there was even any representation um, on the PTO from like an off-road standpoint? No, there's not. I mean, there's a couple Xterra athletes that are, that are part of that organization, but not because of their Xterra accolades. No, it's very, very heavily, you know, Ironman driven that, that PTO. So there hasn't been any discussion that I know of about bringing Xterra into that fold. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think that, you know, it's just fascinating you know, to, and I don't know how far we want to go down this rabbit hole of talking about the PTO and, and, you know, you know, their focus, but, you know, it's rather interesting to have an organization dedicated to triathlon and pro triathlon, but exclude, you know, a, a significant portion of the sport as well. Right. Welcome to Xterra. Well, I, and that's my question. The last like, 20 years. Is that a, is that a PTO thing or is it an Xterra thing? You know? Um, you know, where, where does that, well, that's come? kind of how Xterra has been, or, and I'll, I'll say, I'll expand that to off-road triathlon, but Xterra is off-road triathlon really, but that's, I mean, that's how we, and I'll say we, even though I'm fat and out of shape, but that's how we've been treated since I started in 99. Yeah. Every, I mean, when I, 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 my best year, I finished sixth at the world championship and the first question that anyone from the media or anything asked is when are you going to basically switch to a real triathlon <laughs> and in hindsight of my career that ruined me because I should have focused on Xterra that's what I'm good at that's what I like doing but everyone told me you should do Ironman you should do World Cup you're, you're a fast runner you should do World Cups I'm a shit swimmer what am I doing World Cups for you know but that's but the, the PTO people everyone involved with the PTO still that's how they look at off-road is man it doesn't really count, you know, it's, it's not really triathlon. So, but is that the PTO or is it? I'll shut up. Xterra, I'll just my answer. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm curious to know, like, if it is that is, if it is that perspective of like the PTO or if it is purely Xterra wanting to keep Xterra, Xterra, um, you know, cause I'm sure that there has to be like, there's a caveat with getting involved with, um, you know, the PTO, you know? Oh, I, I, I don't know. I just, I don't think that, I mean, I, I can't really speak personally to it. I haven't been asked to be a part of the PTO. I mean, as, as far as I know, it, it has nothing to do with, you know, any kind of Xterra. It's all about, you know, Ironman or ITU rank, kind of this world ranking system um, that Xterra is not a part of. Um, but I, I mean, I think it's a, it's a great thing. I think it was really good timing for a lot of those elites to, to be able to, uh, you know, still consider themselves professional athletes through a year where they didn't, weren't able to race. And unfortunately, yeah, the Xterra athletes were kind of left out of that, which, which means uh, it's been hard to define what it means to be an elite athlete or a professional athlete. If your sport is Xterra and you're not getting a, you know, a paycheck for, <laughs> for, for not racing. Um, but no, I mean, at the end of the day, I, I'm towards the end of my career and I've had a great ride and I've had a whole lot of fun racing Xterra. And that's this pandemic is, it's kind of re, you know, really redefined what, what that means to me to be a, you know, a professional athlete, you know, whether it's, if you're just solely basing it on, you know, what is your annual income from the sport or sponsorship or things related to the sport or you know, Hey, I, I'm racing at the highest level that I can and seeing what my potential is in this sport. And I'm having a, a heck of a lot of fun doing it. Um, you know, that's, I don't know. It, I think the pandemic really was a huge mind shift for, for me and probably for a lot of people, which in, in some ways it, 
it put things in perspective and, you know, kind of a depressing way, maybe a little bit of like, Hey, like this was a fun hobby. Um, <laughs> but maybe that wasn't, uh, that wasn't paying my bills or whatever. And how to, or, you know, can I justify all the energy that I put into that sport? But then maybe, maybe, you know, making a living or making a certain amount of income was not the, the end all be all or the ultimate goal. Maybe it was like having those incredible life experiences that you couldn't really, you know, trade for anything and having a whole lot of fun doing it. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much my past like four years of self-reflection <laughs> summed up there. But that's the interesting, like what you're talking about. I think the con the idea of like if you're in if you're in a non-salaried sport, so if you're not a football, basketball, hockey, baseball player, or something like that. If you're in a, a otherwise financially driven sport, like the idea of like what is a professional athlete has really, I think has completely evolved because now, I mean, some of your biggest, most recognized air quotes, professional athletes right now are essentially social media influencers, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, a big... Boxing has a ton of money in it, right? I mean, boxing has, is a really old sport. I mean, arguably one of the oldest because there was two cavemen that hit each other once, you know, but the most recognized boxer in the world right now is Logan Paul, who is not a professional boxer. He's a yeah. YouTube idiot, but he is the most recognized boxer in the world and he's going to fight. He's going to get absolutely destroyed by an old Floyd Mayweather in a few months but that he, that him is an example like you just said your your career is coming in the end and I I would say if you're interested I don't think it is because you have you've already got an audience you've got people who know who you are and you don't have to keep doing exteras on like a professional level but you could re be a professional athlete because people are still interested in like what's Josiah doing and you could start doing schemo or whatever and talking about that. Like and I pick on ski mountaineering because it's a really small community, but you're in an area where there's a lot of that happening. And if you start a YouTube channel and an Instagram and blah, 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 you could present more value to your sponsors and partners than someone who is finishing sixth one place off the podium in every Ironman they enter, right? So that there's a really interesting, like what is yeah. a professional athlete anymore, right? Yeah. That's, yeah, that's the truth. But that's what's that's what's funny. And wouldn't, wouldn't that be funny if, uh, <laughs> if, if that was a, you know, a much more successful uh, career option was to take a step back from performance and just, yeah, you know, talk about how exciting my life is. <laughs> and, uh, well, and yeah, the thing is, that you have to be, and I'm, I'm saying this in a very economic sense and trying to be polite to the people who do this for a living, but you have to be a raging narcissist, really, right? Like you have to, <laughs> you have, to have complete comfort with broadcasting almost everything about yourself that maybe someone is going to and then you have to like really be uninhibited in pursuing the things that for whatever reason is what people are interested in you know <laughs> so i mean i don't know whatever i don't i can't come up with something off the top of my head but if if a thing you don't really want to be your primary thing that you're pushing happens to be the thing that gets clicks that's the road you go down right right so yeah I mean, back to picking on guys like Logan Paul. I mean, you just, you go up and you, you be a complete jackass and a lot of people pay attention to it. And now your life is, I'm a jackass. And I don't know him personally. He might actually be a halfway decent, I doubt it. But his persona that he is tethered to now is jackass. Unless you want to quit doing that and go get a job as an engineer or something, right? Like, um, so it, it's interesting because the potential is there for the, to change like what being a pro athlete is, but you also have to, it takes a very 
a certain mentality to do it, which I don't think that most people who are pro triathletes, I don't, I don't think that's the mentality of what most people who are intrigued by what triathlon is. I don't think that's their, their mentality. So anyway, a lot of, a lot of, <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's a, a whole different discussion, but <laughs> yeah. yeah. But but that was for, in the short term, I'm going to stay focused on performance and helping other people achieve some. Yeah. So, Josiah, are you, is, I mean, is the ultimate goal this year to pursue the world championships? Yes. Excellent. And there is yes. going to be a world championships? December 5th. So I okay. moved it back. Yeah. Um, just to, to get more international participation. Do you know if, uh, have they released any of the, I mean, I guess any of the details, like are they splitting it up into two days or, you know, really one thing that we're waiting for from Iron Man is how, like, how are we going to accommodate the mass amount of people that are going to be coming to the island while also, uh, you know, meeting the protocols that are probably still going to be necessary from the virus perspective? Yeah, no, I haven't heard any details on that. And I think that Xterra's mindset is, let's start with Alabama. Let's, let's learn a lot on, you know, let's, let's have protocols in place that are in line with, you know, the, the local municipality and also, you know, the, the athletes that you're catering to. And then let's, you know, put all these things in place, see how it goes. Let's, let's make adjustments and let's make tweaks throughout the season and, and kind of refine that approach as they move towards that world championship. And it's definitely, it's definitely a modified season. It's a modified schedule, um, yeah. international. I mean, I say international racing is totally different, but right now what we have is a lot of international national athletes, you know, coming to the U S to do some of these early races, which is kind of a surprise. So do you like, is the race field from the pro perspective? Is it like, would you say it's standard size? from what it's been years past or because it's the first race, have you seen like a, an influx in, you know, pros who are anxious to race and toe the line? Um, you know, one thing that was interesting, again, I, I jump back to road because that's like my primary uh, format, you know, these first like three races of the year have had fields, pro fields close to like a hundred pro athletes, which is, you know, pretty massive for, you know, your standard yeah. races. Yeah. A lot of pent up, demand, I think, but, um, no, I mean, I was, I was kind of surprised to see, um, you know, athletes from New Zealand, South Africa, Canada, you know, coming in for this race, but no, not, not quite the same with Xterra. Uh, but it was good to see, you know, some representation of international field, uh, you know, we're not seeing Europeans making the trip over, but they've got their own series. And I think it's going to be, you know, Europeans staying in Europe, um, for the most part, and then hopefully, all meeting at the world championship. So it'll, it'll be a different kind of year, I think. Yeah. So, and again, we touched upon this earlier um, and we kind of took off in a, in a certain direction, but right. <laughs> I mean, no, it doesn't matter. I mean, it was all great conversation, but for me, I'm curious because I'm somebody who, um, you know, obviously I race road, I race long course um, very frequently. Um, I've done one Xterra race and it was, a, I mean, quite frankly, probably one of the worst experiences on a bike that I've had. Um, and, it, and it was Las Vegas. Yeah. So and it was Vegas. It wasn't Xterra's best representation either. <laughs> <laughs> so while, you know, while I was super excited about it and I actually was having fun until, you know, I descended into a, an area which I wasn't familiar with um, and had a little bit of a mishap. How, so if somebody was in my position going into Oak Mountain, what, like, what, like, what would you tell them? What would you, what would you say to focus on from that course specifically? How would you kind of coach them through maybe the nerves of tackling the bike course? Cause that's where my biggest, you know, that was where my biggest uncertainty was. Yeah. So I think, you know, first of all, adjust ex expectations, you know, it's not, I think people, they write this, this story in their head and they, sometimes they, they have to, to, to be able to get to that start line. But I think adjust expectations, you know, it's your first time out. Um, the goal is to finish the race. Number one, you know, have fun doing it. Um, but you want to, 
you want to take risks with your effort, not by going above your skill level, right? So lots of places to pedal hard on the course, but a lot of places where you're going to have to be a little more cautious than some of the other athletes you're around. But I think, you know, use it as a learning experience. You can hop on wheels. If somebody is coming up behind you, you know, you yield the trail to them and then you benefit from that. You hop on their wheel you see what kind of lines they're taking. You see how they go around a corner. Um, and, you know, I remember the very first mountain bike race I ever did. There was a local pro and I said, Hey, you know, I, you know, doing this race, you got any tips, <laughs> you know, like five minutes before the race, <laughs> like, yeah, go really fast in between the corners, <laughs> you know, slow down before the corner, <laughs> you know, and then get around, you know, get around that corner and pedal hard again, you know, hard, hard, hard. And it's funny. I don't know, you know, it's like, you don't, don't expect yourself to, to do something that's above your skill level. You, you know, work with the skill set that you have. And if it's not descending and cornering at high rates of speed then don't don't attempt to do that because what you don't realize when you're starting out mountain biking is that that line of control you can cross it very easily and so here's that line of control you're usually way below or you're just above and if you're just above it's disaster right and so you know as you as you get better you get closer and closer to that line of, yeah. of being in control so you might just have to you know, take a little more caution and adjust expectations. And, and usually people, if they do that, then they see that there's so much more potential for them to improve and they get excited about the improvement that they have. Like my first race in Keystone, you know, to the second year, I think I improved by 45 minutes, which was pretty much all on the bike. <laughs> you know, So it's, that can be exciting to see that you have potential to improve like that. Yeah. Interesting that you say that. that's, well, it's great advice, definitely. And I definitely going down that hill and into an area that I was unfamiliar with was <laughs> of where I should be at that point in time. Also, I've never, like, I never encountered something like that before. So I went down and I hit it and I was like, holy shit, like, this is totally new. And it was way too fast at that point in time. Yeah. To I mean, adjustment. Get, get your weight back, you know, yeah. break, break when you're going in a straight line. Um, so that you can let off and feather the brakes when you're going around a corner, you know, just basic stuff that keep your body upright, you know, so you're not blowing through corners, going off the trail. Yeah. Because, because really the reality is that a really competent cyclist dumps just the right amount of speed, you know, to go around a corner so that they can exit that corner going just a little bit faster than somebody else where you think, oh, these pros are, they're not breaking. They're just ripping around all these corners. Like, no, they're, they're using their brakes strategically and they're, you know, jamming on front and rear brake at the same time to dump speed really fast. And then they're accelerating really fast out of those corners. And so, yeah, I think you just, you use the skill set you have and you learn a lot as you're going. And I think that's also something that's pretty, pretty interesting is like, you know, the drive to learn something new. And we talked earlier about, um, you know, like what, is now attracting people to sport, you know, is it these long adventures or is it, you know, Iron Man with this, like, like this desire to prove yourself and how far you can go. And I think something that I've realized in like, and I'm going to jump back to Iron Man racing again, and it does apply to Xterra racing at the same, at the same time, I've always just chose the path of least resistance in regards to this, which is sticking to road, but you know, my, I was racing 70.3s for, you know, a very long time. And I really got to the point where I was like, this is freaking stupid. It was almost like, it was like literally the same race, every single race. And I, I could go through the motions mindlessly. And it was something that it was like, I know where I'm going to place. I know how I'm going to do. There may be a small deviation, but there's literally no surprises. And the reason I made the jump to long course and, you know, quite frankly, probably off-road sometime in the future once I get to the point, the same point with long course, um, you know, is, is this desire to learn something new and not fully understand the race and the strategies behind what it takes to be successful, right? So there's this like, like you need to learn to get to the top. And even though I've raced 70.3s, there's still this, this gap of like, how do you execute flawlessly? And I think that's something that we talked about the adventure perspective and this need to like prove how far you can drive your body into the ground. 
but then there's this also this challenge of like like you know what does it take and like this learning process that I find fascinating myself personally you know yeah I, I think that there's exterior you'll see a lot of the you know a lot of that that type a personality that attracts a lot of people to the road but you'll also see you know, you know maybe there are some people out there that you know maybe they did a, a team sport in high school and they have like good balance and they played basketball or whatever and they they say oh you know i i do love to push myself but i don't want to be stuck at you know at one intensity the whole time and i want to use agility and balance and and i said oh i i think i could be you know a really good technical rider i do like to run on trails and you know have you know a non medicured trail that i'm running on and so you know people see that there's there's this skill element that is much bigger um in off-road triathlon and maybe that's maybe that's not appealing to everybody but i think that it is appealing to a lot of people to say hey there's another there's something more dynamic here something yeah. another you know whole set of skills that i could learn and not just be an endurance athlete. No, I totally agree with you. Awesome. We've been talking for a hell of a long time, guys. <laughs> you may well, need to I edit that down a little bit. bit. <laughs> Was that you? Speaking of people's I, attention spans. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I rambled a bit, but you know, that's still, I mean, literally that's like a, a, a virus side effect that I've noticed for myself because I moved to a new town and within about three, what was it? Three months, two months, like we went, like everything went into lockdown and that. So then you end up spending like a year pretty much by myself. So then you get into situations like this and it's like, I can't shut up because I don't talk to very many people. It's just kind of weird, but. So just uh, before, you know, before we kind of close it out, like, how do you think the race is going to unfold from the pros perspective? Do you have any thoughts, opinions? Um, you know, what do you think it's going to look like? Well, I think that there's going to be a very select lead swim pack. Um, I think you're talking about just my race. Yeah. Your race personally. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's going to be kind of damage control on the swim for me, trying to cut my losses you know, stay within that two minute buffer, getting out of the water um, and hoping that there's not a lot of guys to try to fight through on the, the first section of single track. Um, and then I think up front, you got Sam Osborne, Bradley Weiss, and then you're going to have, um, you know, probably Eric Langerstrom and maybe Art Andy Starkwitz, but I think that they're going to be probably dispatched pretty early <laughs> in the single track. And you're going to have those two guys up the road quite a ways. You'll have like Kieran McPherson, Brandon Rikita, um, you know, some very um, skilled, competent pros out on the course that hopefully I'll get to see them, you know, somewhere around the half point of the race. And uh, I don't, you know, hard, hard to say, but I know that, you know, Bradley, the defending world champion, um, Sam Osborne won the, the North American tour in 2019. He beat me at that, the race uh, two years ago. So I think they're going to be, uh, it's going to be really hard to get to the front of that race. Um, but hopefully uh, my performance hasn't fallen off too much. I think I've had the fastest bike split in Alabama for, yeah. for a very long time since Conrad Stoltz was racing out there. Um, so hopefully I can make up some time on that lead group and, and be able to express my fitness and, and show some performance on the run. Um, sometimes that the race, it's kind of cool because that race, you'll see nobody, see nobody. And then that race kind of comes together, you know, with a 5k to go on the bike. And all of a sudden, then you've got four people, you know, coming into transition within 30 seconds. And then we, all of a sudden we've got a race. So you just, you just don't know you. And with Xterra, you, you don't know what's going on up the road and you just, you know, keep hammering, keep hammering, keep hammering. And you just, you just have to have some sort of faith that the, the race is going to come back together and you just never concede. And, and hopefully that's how it'll play out. And hopefully I'll, I'll get myself into the race, uh, hopefully sooner rather than later. 